Hi, it's Jen, and I'm at work, so I thought, since I have a little spare time, and last week I talked about some of my favorite authors and books, that I would read a little bit out of John Saul's Blackstone Chronicles. This is the serial terror novel he put out in the 90s, about the same time that Stephen King put out The Green Mile. Also, he also put them out in parts like this. I think they used to call them Penny Dreadfuls or Pulp Fictions. I'm not really sure, but I thought it was pretty neat. And so I haven't read this since the 90s, so I'm going to give it a shot. And the Blackstone Chronicles is about an asylum. So let me read a little bit from the back first. Okay, Master of Terror in All Its Forms. John Saul now thrills us with a serial novel that brings the terrifying life of the small New England town of Blackstone and the secrets and sins that lay buried there. From the top of Blackstone's highest hill, the old Blackstone Asylum cast its shadow over the village. Built in the 1890s, the asylum has stood vacant for decades. But now the wrecking ball is about to strike smashing into stone and unleashing a terrible evil, an unholy fear long locked within these walls. Soon, strange gifts will begin to appear on the doorsteps of Blackstone's finest citizens. Each bears a mysterious history. Each brings a horrifying power to harm. Each reveals another thread in the suspensefully woven web of the Blackstone Chronicles. So this is part one. Each, each part will be like one of those gifts left on, on someone's doorstep, that, and then they'll all tie in together later. Okay, so Blackstone Chronicles Part 1. The editor of the Blackstone Chronicles, Oliver Metcalf, nervously presides over the ceremony to begin demolition of the old asylum. But the building's fate hangs in the balance as financing problems halt the project. Contractor Bill McGuire, all set to proceed, can't hide his dismay. With a family and another baby on the way, he can't afford delays. Then a package arrives at the McGuire's, a beautiful antique doll with long blonde hair. His daughter Megan wraps her arms around it. His wife Elizabeth remains suspicious. Who sent the doll? Who is it for? What neither Elizabeth nor Bill can know is that this innocent gift brings with it a murderous secret. Okay. So I'll just read a little bit from it for a little while. And then I'll probably, I'll, I'll get, I want to get back to doing the coloring at 3 a.m. videos too. I haven't done it in a couple weeks. I do. I want to do that, so let's see if I can do both. <clears throat> okay. And this part one is called, um, let's see, An Eye for an Eye of the Doll. Okay. Sorry, the d delivery trucks out there are pretty loud. <laughs> Seth Thomas regulator began to chime the hour. Oliver Metcalf kept trying only long enough to finish the sentence before abandoning the editorial he was composing to gaze thoughtfully at the wood-cased clock that had hung on the wall of the Blackstone Chronicles one-room office for far more years than Oliver himself could remember. It was the clock that first fascinated him when his uncle brought him here more than 40 years ago and taught him how to tell time. And the clock still fascinated him with its rhythmic ticking and because it kept time so perfectly that it had to be adjusted by no more than a single minute every year. Now, after marking the thousands of hours of his life with its soft chime, 
It was reminding Oliver that the hour had come for him to perform his part in an event that would take place only once. Today, the town of Blackstone was going to take the first significant step in the destruction of part of its history. Oliver Metcalf, as editor and publisher of the town's weekly newspaper, had been asked to make a speech. He made preparatory notes for several days, but still had no idea precisely what he would say when the moment finally arrived for him to stand at the podium. The great stone structure rising behind him and his face and face his fellow townsmen. As he picked up the sheaf of notes and tucked it inside the inside pocket of his tweed jacket, he wondered if inspiration would strike him when at last he had to speak, or whether he would stare speechlessly out at the gathering crowd as they gazed waiting at him. Questions would be in their minds, questions that no one had spoken aloud for years. Questions to which he had no answers. He locked the office door behind him and stepped out onto the sidewalk. Crossing the street to cut through the town square, he considered turning back, skipping the ceremonial entirely and instead finishing the editorial upon which he had been working all morning. It was, after all, exactly the kind of day that was meant for staying indoors. The sky was slate gray, and the previous night's wind had stripped the last of the leaves from the great trees that had spread a protective canopy above the town from spring through fall. In early spring, when the enormous oaks and maples first began to bud, the canopy was the palest of greens. But as summer progressed, the foliage matured and thickened, darkening to a deep green that shaded Blackstone from August's hot glare and sheltered it from the rain squalls that swept through on their way to the Atlantic seacoast several miles to the east. Over the last few weeks, abundant green had given way to the splendor of fall, and for a while the village had a glorified in... Sorry. <laughs> Lost. And for a while the village had gloried in autumn's shimmering golden, red, and russet tones. Now the ground was littered with leaves already a dead-looking brown, already beginning the slow process of decay that would return them to the soil from which they had originally sprung. Oliver Metcalf started towards the top of the hill, whereas most of the townspeople would soon be gathered. Snow had not yet fallen, but a sodden, chill rain had accompanied last night's wind. It seemed to Oliver that a damp, freezing winter was about to descend. The gray light of the day seemed perfectly perfectly to reflect his own bleak mood. The trees, with their huge naked limbs, raised their skeletal branches grotesquely towards the sky, as if seeking to ward off the lowering clouds with fleshless, twisted fingers. Ducking his head against the ominous morning, Oliver walked quickly through the streets, nodding distractedly to the people who spoke to him, meanwhile trying to focus his mind on what he would say to the crowd that would soon be gathered around the best-known building in town, the Blackstone Asylum. Throughout Oliver's life, throughout the lives of everyone in Blackstone, the massive building constructed of stones dug from the fields surrounding the village had loomed at the top of the town's highest hill. Its long shuttered windows gazed out over the town, not as if it were abandoned, but rather as if it were sleeping, sleeping and waiting someday to awaken. A chill passed through Oliver as the thought crossed his mind, but he quickly shook it off. No, it would never happen. Today, the destruction of the Blackstone Asylum would commence. A wrecking ball would swing, hurling its weight against those heavy gray stones, and after dominating the town for a full century, the building would finally be torn apart, its stone walls demolished, its turrets fallen, its green copper roof sold off for scrap. As Oliver stepped through the ornate wrought iron gates that pierced the fence surrounding the asylum's entire 10 acres and started up the wide curving driveway leading to its front door, an arm fell across his shoulders and he heard his uncle's familiar voice. Quite a day, wouldn't you say, Oliver? Harvey 
Connolly said, his booming, hearty voice belaying his 83 years. Oliver's gaze followed his uncle's, fixing on the brooding building, and he wondered what was going through the old man's mind. No point in asking. Despite their closeness, he'd always found his uncle far more comfortable discussing ideas than emotions. If you talk about emotions, you have to talk about people, Harvey told him back when he was only 10 or 11 and home from boarding school for Christmas. And talking about people is gossip. I don't gossip and you shouldn't either. The words had clearly signaled Oliver that there were many things his uncle did not want to discuss. Still, as the old man gazed up at the building that had risen on North Hill only a few years before his birth, Oliver couldn't help trying one last time. Your father built it, Uncle Harvey, he said softly. Aren't you just a little sorry to see it go? His uncle's grip tightened on his shoulder. No, I'm not, Harvey Connolly replied, his voice grating as he spoke the words. And neither should you be. Good riddance to it. What I say, and we should all forget everything that ever happened there. His hand fell from Oliver's shoulder. Everything, he said again. Half an hour later, Oliver stood at the podium that had erected in front of the asylum's imposing portico. His eyes surveyed the crowd. Nearly everyone had come. The president of the bank was there, as was the contractor whose company would demolish most of the old asylum, keeping only the facade. The plan was to replace the interior with a complex of shops and restaurants that promised to bring prosperity to Blackstone that no one had known since the years when the institution itself had provided the economic basis for the town's livelihood. Everyone who was involved in the project was there, but there were others as well, people whose grandparents and even great-grandparents had once worked within the stone walls behind him. Now they hoped that the new structure might provide their children and grandchildren with jobs. Beyond the assemblance, just inside the gate, Oliver could see a small stone house that had been deeded to the last superintendent of the asylum. Upon the occasion of his marriage to the daughter of the chairman of the asylum's board of directors. When the Blackstone Asylum had finally been abandoned and its last superintendent had died, that house too stood empty for several years. Then the young man who had inherited, having graduated from college, returned to Blackstone and moved back into that house the house in which he had been born. Oliver Metcalf had come home. He hadn't expected to sleep at all on that first night, but to his surprise, the two-story stone cottage seemed to welcome him back, and he immediately felt as if he was home. The ghost he expected had not appeared, and within a few years, he had almost forgot he had ever lived anywhere else. But in all the years since then, living in the shadow of the asylum, his father had once run. Oliver had not once set foot inside that building. He told himself he had no need to. Deep in his heart, he had known he couldn't. Something inside its walls, something unknowable, terrified him. Now, as the crowd fell into an unexpected silence, Oliver adjusted the microphone and began to speak. Today marks a new beginning in the history of Blackstone. For nearly a century, a single structure has affected every family, every individual in our town. Today, we begin the process of tearing that structure down. This signifies not only the end of one era, but the beginning of another. The process of replacing the old Blackstone Asylum with the new Blackstone Center will not be simple. Indeed, when the new building is finally completed, its facade will look much as the asylum looks today constructed of the same stones that have stood on the site for nearly a hundred years. It will look familiar to all of us, but at the same time, all of it will be different. For half an hour, Oliver continued speaking, his thoughts organizing themselves as he spoke in the same simple, orderly prose that flowed from him when he sat at his computer, composing a feature or an editorial for the newspaper. Then, as the bell in the Congregational Church downtown began to strike the hour of noon, he turned to Bill McGuire, the contractor, who would oversee the, de demolish the <laughs> demolition of the old building and construction of the new complex of shops and restaurants as well. 
Nodding, Oliver stepped away from the podium, walking down the steps that joined the crowd, and turned to face the building as the great lead wrecking ball swung for the first time towards the century-old edifice. As the last chime of the church bell faded away, the ball punched through the west wall of the building. A sigh that sounded like a moaning wind passed through the crowd as it watched half a hundred field stones tumble to the ground, leaving a gaping hole in the wall that had once stood solid for ten decades. Oliver thought, Oliver though, heard nothing of the sigh, for as the ball smashed through the wall, a blinding flash of pain shot through his head. Through the pain, a fleeting vision appeared. A man walks up the steps towards the huge double doors of the asylum. In his hand, he, in his hand, he holds the hand of a child. The child is crying. The man ignores the child's cries. As man and boy approach the great oaken doors, they swing open. Man and boy pass through. The enormous doors swing closed again. Okay, I think I'll stop there. And I will just, whenever I have a spare time, read a little bit and see how it goes. Okay, well, for anybody that sat through that and listened, thank you very much. I, again, am not a professional narrator, and I'm not used to reading out loud. I'm hoping I will get better at it. But this is a really good book, a really good series. Um, I loved it. So, and it's, you know, about a, a spooky old asylum where some atrocities happened. And it's a, it's great. It's a, it's a fun read. It's scary. So I look forward to reading some more of it soon. Okay, Den out.